Hello, everyone, and either welcome or welcome back to the Gender Libertarian Podcast. If you do like this, please rate, comment, and subscribe. You can find me on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Spotify, YouTube, and on my Patreon page. So we've made it through yet another week in our crazy news cycle, and this was a somewhat shortened holiday weekend, so I hope everybody enjoyed their 4th of July. I hope the government-issued professional-grade fireworks did not keep you up all night. But I hope everybody had a chance to kind of get outside, maybe socially distance, see some people, maybe have a cookout, see some fireworks. Anyway, hope you had a nice time, but now we are back to normalcy, and so I will start where I have been starting, and that is with the unemployment numbers. A um, little bit of a mixed bag this week. Um, for the week ending on June 27th, we had an additional 1.4 million new people applying for unemployment. So like I've been saying for the past couple of weeks, it feels like we're starting to kind of plateau at somewhere in like that 1.4 million a week range, which is, again, not good. Very scary, still way too many people to be adding on a weekly basis, but we did get the June jobs report a little early because of 4th of July. They did end up releasing it a couple days early, and there was some very good news in the June jobs report. Um, In the month of June, the economy gained 4.8 million jobs, which is far exceeding what the estimates were. We were expecting an increase of more like 2.9 million. So definitely overperformed expectations. And it's good progress, especially on the back of the May report, which if you remember, I talked about that. In May, there was not an expectation of really any kind of job gain. And we ended up the, the final number ended up being 2.7 million for May. So definitely an upward trend. This basically not completely doubles, but it adds about another 2 million over and beyond what May's numbers were. So there are jobs entering back into the economy. Um, unemployment is still at 11.1% nationwide though. So we are still... In, in a depression, jobs-wise, I mean, it's still over 10%, and 10% is like an insane benchmark, but that's like where we're at right now. Like 10% would be considered like, okay, that's, that's, that's somewhat good news. And we are still at nationwide 19.3 million unemployed people who are still, the way they count that is by people who are still filing unemployment claims. I don't think at this point anybody has aged out of unemployment yet. So I think that's a fairly decent number to go by. I don't think there's like a hidden couple of million somewhere else that have like fallen off the unemployment rolls yet. So still, still losing jobs, still not great, but there is some hope. There are jobs being added. How exactly you parse these two numbers, I'm not entirely sure. Because obviously there are still people who are either being furloughed or laid off. Um, there are businesses that are closing, sadly. So, and, and like I said, we're still at a ridiculously high amount of unemployed people. But it's it's trying. The economy is trying. It's really trying. And I hope it doesn't get derailed by having to do lockdowns again. Because we're starting to hear more chatter about possibly maybe some states going back into lockdown. Um, I know Texas over the past week has now mandated face masks in public statewide. Um, I know there's been some spikes in Florida. There's been spikes in Texas. Um, it seems like a lot of the southeastern states are starting to spike, including Georgia. So Fingers crossed on that, that hopefully we don't have to do this all over again, especially now that it seems like looking at the, the improvement from May to June, that there is some kind of life in the economy and it's trying to come back and it's trying to add jobs so that we can get unemployment back to something of a manageable amount. Let's just hope this doesn't go, go off the rails again if we have to shut everything back down. But to move on from our country's woes to another country's woes, um, the Hong Kong situation has gotten worse over the past week. And if you don't know or don't exactly know the backstory of what is going on and why this is such a bad development for Hong Kong, let me try to explain. So Hong Kong for hundreds and hundreds of years was a British colony. 
and then through a series of unfortunate events that can basically be summed up as China's asshole. In 1997, uh, the British government had to pull out of Hong Kong. Um, the CCP was no longer allowing them to renew their lease on the land. It was no longer going to tolerate British governance in Hong Kong because it's always been technically part of China. But like I said, Britain had been leasing the land for centuries. Hong Kong had operated under basically a Western style democracy and capitalism, which obviously is not what China does. So China finally put the kibosh on that. And the deal was that Britain would leave Hong Kong and leave it to basically, it was considered like a special administrative state of China. But that from 1970, from 1997 forward, that Hong Kong, the the political systems, the financial systems, the social systems that were in place when British, when the British left, would be left in place for at least 50 years. So that would put us at Hong Kong being theoretically untouchable by China until 2047. And now it feels like we should be living in 2047 as long as this year has been, but we still live in 2020. And so this past week, um, China has decided that they are going to extend basically their law over Hong Kong, especially in regards to speech. Basically, you can no longer criticize the Chinese government in Hong Kong. And there is some language that it's it's a little difficult to understand because it seems to be that there are two different versions of this law floating around, one in English and one in Chinese, and they seem to say slightly different things, which that's that's sketchy in and of itself, but hey, it's China we're dealing with, that even if you say something and you're not in China, like if you go to China, you could be persecuted for that. So basically, this is something that applies to everybody on the planet, but is specifically aimed at Hong Kong because obviously there have been the protests, there have been the protests in the streets, obviously, and of people calling for Hong Kong to be able to break away from China completely and be their own country. And so China basically just reneged on their deal with the UK and are starting to crack down on the citizens of Hong Kong. And there are already starting to be arrests over speech violations. And so there's been a renewed call in the United States and in other countries to accept fleeing Hong Kongers. And I absolutely agree with that. I, I I have said here on the pod before, I think the best thing that we can possibly do, not just because it's the correct thing to do from a humanitarian perspective, but also because it would just completely fuck over China, it's just brain drain Hong Kong. Like take all their talent and bring it here or to any other country. Just get it out of Hong Kong. That way, since China decided that they wanted to renege on this deal, fine. You can have nothing left. You can have a husk. You can have just salt the earth. Leave it for them. But as it stands right now, and I did a Twitter thread about this, but I do still want to talk about it here, is that as great and wonderful as that sentiment is, and I do entirely agree with it, the way our immigration regulations are right now, that is basically impossible. Um, asylum has been effectively ended for anybody trying to come into the United States. Our refugee cap is at 16000 for the fiscal year 2020. And fiscal year 2020 started in October of last year. So, I mean, there's just not any refugee slots left. Um, visas, <laughs> I mean, forget it. It's... Even under normal circumstances, it takes forever to get a visa into the United States. And these people need to go now. Like, I do not see China allowing travel to go unrestricted for too much longer in Hong Kong. I think that's going to be the next thing they crack down on is you're going to start seeing flights canceled, flights going from Hong Kong to the U.S. or Hong Kong to the U.K., which... The UK has already said that basically anybody who was eligible for British citizenship before 1997, before they left, is welcome to come to the UK, whether they have a British passport or not. So I think that leaves the door open for, I think it's 3 million people to go to the UK if they want to. But 
as it stands right now, there's just no way of letting people fleeing Hong Kong into the United States. And this is why I spend so much time on immigration and it just, it kills me. It just, this breaks my heart because so much of this was done just to spite people who were trying to immigrate here from the global South, basically slamming the door on them. And in the process, you slammed the door on everybody. And now that you have a serious humanitarian crisis, not that we didn't already have plenty of those on this planet already, but now you have this looming crisis where these people, I mean, God bless them. They're still fighting. They're still fighting. But I mean, you already know how this is going to end. You know what China is going to do. And their only option is to get the hell out. But they can't come here because we don't do that anymore. And it's just, it's, it's heartbreaking. It's absolutely fucking heartbreaking to see what happens when you institute these kinds of draconian immigration policies. And then now it's going to affect people whom it wasn't intended to affect. It wasn't intended to punish, but now this is where we're at. Like we don't do immigration anymore. And I mean, I grew up obviously in the eighties and nineties when letting people into the U S who are fleeing totalitarian communist regimes was kind of a thing we were known for. It's kind of what we did both with people fleeing the USSR, people fleeing Cuba. And it's just, there's no, there's, there's no door anymore. And it sucks. It just really, really sucks because now the people of Hong Kong who want to flee, who want to come to the United States are going to pay the price because Our administration decided that it was more important to try to stick it to poor brown people. And even on top of that, because our administration is dumb. The other thing that makes all of this impossible is U.S. Customs and Immigration Service, USCIS. They just had to furlough 13,000 employees because... Our administration seems to have forgot that USCIS is one of the few government agencies that is funded almost entirely by fees paid into the agency by people using its services. So what happens when you drastically cut the amount of people who are eligible to use USCIS's service? Exactly. They don't make any money. And so now they've had to furlough everybody. So now... Not only for people trying to flee Hong Kong, but people trying to flee anywhere, people who currently have cases open, people who are trying to work through the paperwork, because that's what USCIS does, is they handle the paperwork side of the immigration process. Everything's at a standstill There's because there, there's nobody to process the paperwork because everybody's furloughed. Like, it's so absurd. Like, I, oh my God, it's horrible. It's absolutely fucking horrible. And there is a bill in Congress right now to try to create some kind of something for people fleeing Hong Kong. And while I I cross my fingers for that, I hope maybe Congress comes up with something to help these people. That being said, we have been waiting for Congress to come up with something to help Venezuelans and Cubans for years now, and it hasn't happened. Like, there has been talks on and off to do TPS status for Venezuelans. It never quite seems to get off the ground. I'm it's just, I, oh, these people don't have time to wait for the U.S. to either figure something out congressionally or wait for our judicial system to overturn some of these immigration regulations that have been put into place. They, they have to go now. And it's just, it sucks. It's so sad, but Something that did happen positive on the immigration front, and not everybody is going to view this as a positive, but I do, and is would at least remove one barrier from people trying to flee Hong Kong, is that the courts overturned the rule that the Trump administration put in place that if you are wishing to seek asylum and you travel through another country, you have to apply for asylum in that particular country and be denied before applying in the United States. Stupid rule. Stupid fucking rule. Like, if you wanted to go to another country, you would just go to that country. Like, if you're wanting to come here, it's because you want to come here. I mean, it just it just made no sense. And again, it was one of those policies put in place to screw over people from Central and South America from trying to immigrate here 
And it affected everybody, like, on the globe, unless you could somehow get maybe a nonstop flight from where you are into the United States. Although there was some question about whether if you flew over another country, that means that you went through the country. Yes, this was that freaking absurd. But now at least, I mean, there's there's one barrier that's not in the way for people trying to flee Hong Kong. There's still about 15 other barriers. And like I said, it's going to be all but impossible to accept any of these people into the United States. Hopefully something changes. Hopefully this is the situation where people start to realize just how bad our immigration policy has gotten. And maybe there will be some kind of movement on the congressional front, or at least some kind of more general public awareness of the situation and start to understand that this isn't just about people down at the Mexican border. I mean, this is about people from all over the globe and it's, it's going to hurt people. It's going to get people killed. It has gotten people killed. I mean, our immigration system has gotten people killed. It has sent people back to their country of origins. It denied them asylum and those people ended up dead. So, I mean, I just, I, I hope maybe this brings more awareness to just how we really don't do immigration anymore in this country and how as wonderful as it sounds to say, okay, let's just welcome in all the people fleeing Hong Kong. Legally speaking, we don't have a mechanism for that anymore. And maybe that'll change. But to move on to something completely different, um, Trump made an executive order the other day about making a, a, a new statue garden. It's going to be the Garden of Heroes. And since apparently this is his reaction to everybody tearing down statues, he wants Congress to investigate making a special statue garden, exactly where I'm not entirely sure, but here is the list of statues that Trump wants to be in the Garden of Heroes. Reading this from the executive order, the National Garden should be composed of statues, including statues of John Adams, Susan B. Anthony, Clara Barton, Daniel Boone, Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain, Henry Clay, Davy Crockett, Frederick Douglass, Amelia Earhart, Benjamin Franklin, Billy Graham, Alexander Hamilton, Thomas Jefferson, Martin Luther King Jr., Abraham Lincoln, Douglas MacArthur, Dolly Madison, James Madison, Kristen McCuffey, Audrey Murphy, George S. Patton Jr., Ronald Reagan, Jackie Robinson, Betsy Ross, Antonin Scalia, Harriet Beecher Stowe, Harriet Tubman, Booker T. Washington, George Washington, and Orville and Wilbur Wright. That is the most random grouping of people I could possibly imagine to put in a statue garden. But this is his solution to the tearing down of statues. Is this hodgepodge of, I mean, I I highly doubt your average American even knows who half of these people are, which I guess would be the point of having them in a statue garden so you could go there and learn about them. But I'm just like, who made this list? Who who, who put Scalia on here? And and the, the presidents we get are Washington and Reagan? And Lincoln, which Lincoln already has his own memorial. I mean, obviously, MLK already has his own memorial. So I don't know why they need special ones. They already have ones. Do you move them to the Statue Garden? I don't know. But this was just so, so random and so odd and just so Trump in a way of taking something that's kind of a big issue and doing kind of the bare minimum, which is also the same thing I feel about people tearing down statues. I've discussed this a couple different times, but the whole statue thing is this just like putting band-aids on bullet wounds. Like this is not, this is not helping. This is not doing anything. This is not doing work. This is just being destructive or building something for the sake of just doing it. Like this is not addressing police brutality. This is not addressing racism. This is not addressing the problems in our criminal justice system, which is what I thought we were supposed to be discussing in the first place. That was the point of the Floyd protests, was to protest police brutality. Now we're talking about taking shows off the air 
and having to put like little disclaimers at the beginning of shows and figuring out whether or not we have to capitalize the B in black and brown and tearing down statues of people who have nothing to do with anything. Like we're tearing down statues of Christopher Columbus, which I give Christopher Columbus plenty of shit, but like what the hell does Christopher fucking Columbus have to do with anything right now? What does he have to do with any of that? What do Confederate soldiers have to do with any of this? I just, I just, I don't get it. Like, where, how did we get over here? Why are we talking about statues? There's so much more important shit that we need to be talking about. But now we're going to get more statues and less statues and then maybe more statues. I don't know. All I know is I'm done with the fucking statues. Can we please talk about abolishing qualified immunity? And can we please talk about reforming the police unions or just getting rid of police unions? Can we talk about how we need to figure out new ways of handling policing in this country? Because obviously the way we're doing it right now is not helping. It's not being, it's, it's not working. Like it's, it's clearly not working the way that we need it to work. So instead of like tearing down a statue or building a statue, maybe let's figure out, hey, maybe we should decouple community servicing things from investigating crime type things, you know? Like, maybe we should think about that. But no, we can't put that on Instagram, and that doesn't get you on the news, so apparently that's not what we're doing. <sighs> I, y'all know how I feel about people who hijack a movement for their own shit. I've discussed this before, but it's bullshit. I hate it. Knock it off. We were trying to have a serious discussion before the rest of you showed up. Just go away. Go away. We were trying to have a grown-up conversation. And now we're talking about fucking statues. Like, I just, I can't. I cannot. But the last story I wanted to talk about today, and I kind of wanted to do this first and foremost because this is kind of a throwback for me. Like, I started covering this particular story Way back, like when I first started this podcast, I mean, going all the way back to when I was still making YouTube content. And that is the shitty media men list, which if you weren't around then, I mean, this goes back two plus years, um, right about the same time as the Enzies and Star Zari story came out. There was a list that was supposed to be kind of on the down low, but I mean, obviously, we all understand how the internet works, but it was the shitty media men list. And it was basically an anonymously sourced list of various men in media coupled with accusations of what they did. And these accusations ranged anywhere from, like, being awkward at a party to straight up rape. Like, it was all over the map, and it was supposed to be anonymous, and it was supposed to just be for a certain group of people, but obviously... Like I said, the internet is what it is. And I think this list managed to stay up like eight hours before it went everywhere. And obviously it got sent to men who are on the list, men who weren't on the list. I, just, I mean, it just went wide because of course, of course, if you make a list like that, it's not going to stay secret. Like that's just the stupidest thing ever. So anyway, whole controversy around that. And actually one of the first episodes I did, I think it was actually the second episode I ever did. Um, when I talked about Katie Voifey's piece in Harper's about Twitter feminism, that kind of touched on this whole controversy because the controversy about that piece was that it was rumored that Voifey was going to out Moira Donegan, who is the creator of the Shitty Media Men list. And she ended up outing herself in her own piece. Anyway, moving on. One of the men on the list, Stephen Elliott, decided that he was going to sue Donegan for libel. So... What has come out this past week is that uh, the court is going to allow this libel suit to go forward. It's not going to be thrown out. And there's a couple different reasons. And there's it, it touches on a couple different things. One of them being if Stephen Elliott counted as a public person. Because as, as much as we joke about suing people for libel and defamation, it's actually very difficult to do. There's a lot of very high legal bars that you have to meet to show that basically... Whatever was said about you was damaging enough to you as a person 
or in, in like a professional capacity that it costs you something. Like it costs you money. It costs you a job. It costs you this, that, or the other. Like it's not just, you can't just sue somebody for defamation or libel for just what the fuck ever. Like you have to have some kind of proof that this did damage you in some way. And part of one of those things that you have to meet is showing that you are a public figure. So if you are a public figure, the bar is much higher because you are a public figure. And of course, people are going to talk shit about you. But if you're not, the bar is a little bit lower. And the judge determined that Elliot did not meet the threshold for being a public figure. So and on that part of the case, that's going forward. The other part of this case that's going to be very interesting and kind of why I wanted to bring it up because I have been spending so much time talking about Section 230 is, is Section 230 going to protect Moira Donegan for having created the list? And basically, here's where the judge is at right now. I mean, obviously, you know, Section 230 says that a that a platform cannot be held liable for things that a third party puts on it. So... In one respect, you have this, what would seem to be a slam dunk case, because if it's just that Don again created this list and other people posted anonymously to it, then no, of course you cannot be held responsible because under Section 230, you can't be held responsible. The judge said that as it stands right now, there is no proof that she did not put the information on the list, whether it be that it was like relayed to her and she physically put it there or whatever. But basically at this point, there the, the court is asking, it seems to me, in kind of a roundabout way, are asking for proof of who made that particular post. So discovery on this case is going to be very, very interesting because... I mean, it's almost like the court is asking Donegan to out whoever posted that, which, uh, and, and that's even to say that she knows. I mean, if it was genuinely an anonymous post just on the list that she made, I don't imagine she would have any way of knowing who actually made the claim against him. But it seems like that's what's being asked. So this case is going to definitely be one that tests the limits of Section 230 and might actually end up setting some very interesting precedents going forward, which is odd to think about when you think about how this whole thing started, that this might actually be of some pretty severe consequence to not only Donegan and Elliot, but to how platforms have to handle content and what kind of evidence is going to be expected from the courts to show that a platform did not create the content. And in a case like this, like I said, I don't even know if Donegan can even answer that question. I don't know if she could conclusively prove that she didn't put it there, that somebody else put it there. So... Yeah, that's going to be a case I think a lot of people are going to re-pick up and start following going forward. Like I said, just because of those Section 230 ramifications and that since we have to have this long, massive conversation about Section 230 now, that's, that, that might set some less than savory parameters. But like I said, it's just a real, it's a real squicky case and it's a real tough one because like I said, this is not... It's, the list should never have been made. Like, it just shouldn't. Like, you shouldn't have some kind of anonymous, like, slam book where you can just go and write what the hell ever about who the hell ever. Because, yeah, that stuff can be damaging. I mean, we've seen over the past couple of years what happens to men if they're even accused of rape. Not even that you're charged. Not even that you're found guilty. But that you're just publicly accused of sexual assault. Or not even sexual assault. Of just... Somehow being somehow sexually inappropriate in a way that your accuser deems to have been inappropriate, even though it wasn't necessarily meant with malicious intent or that you intended any kind of harm, but that's where we're at now. So yeah, I'll, I'll be interested to see how that one shakes out. So at this point, I think that's about everything I wanted to cover from this past week. Like I said, it was kind of a short week, so... That's nice. It's, it's nice to have a three-day weekend every now and again. I hope some of you guys got a three-day weekend or at least a two-day weekend. So 
hopefully you guys enjoyed that. You got some rest. You got a chance to maybe do a little bit of socializing. You got to see some fireworks. You maybe got to go be in a pool or the beach or something. Hopefully you just had a nice weekend. So I'm going to go ahead and wrap this up. So as always, if you did make it this far, thank you for listening. And if you do like this, please rate, comment, and subscribe. You can find me on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Spotify, YouTube, and on my Patreon page. Take care and until next time.